Hi, everyone. My name is Majd Bakar, and I run the engineering team responsible for Chromecast and Cast. And this is John Afaki, who is the engineering manager for Google Cast SDK. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about Google Cast evolution and some of the things you should expect from us in the coming year. Nearly a year ago, last July, <clears throat> we announced Chromecast, the small little revolutionary device that allows you to extend your favorite content from your mobile device to the big screen, be it from a phone, tablet, or a laptop, to any HD TV, all for a mere $35. Google Cast is the technology behind Chromecast. It allows developers to enable multi-screen experiences straddling mobile devices and large screen displays. And earlier this year, we also released the Google Cast SDK and the CAST developer program, which now has over 6,000 developers building application for CAST around the world. Let's talk a little bit about our vision and goals for Google CAST. And let's introduce these with the goals we are going to see in the game in a few minutes. First off, our goal is to redefine how people interact with their TVs in the living room and offer them the most compelling experience to bring their favorite content and application to the large screen. Second, we wanted to build an ecosystem to proliferate these experiences, an ecosystem that brings more cast-ready devices and more cast-enabled applications and services to all users. And we want that ecosystem to be open to anyone to participate in and be part of. Finally, we wanted to make sure that wherever cast is used, it is consistent to the user and consistent for you to develop. <clears throat> users do not need to learn a new way to use their favorite app. And you, the developer, do not need to learn a new development paradigm. Let's first dive into the interaction model. <clears throat> One of the things that was obvious to us was how hard it is to interact with the 10-foot UI. Whether you are browsing a large media library, trying to decide what to watch, searching for a show, or entering credential for your favorite application, using a traditional D-pad <coughs> remote, or even a full-blown keyboard from the couch make that experience complex. On the other hand, technologies like gyroscope and cameras used as remote controls resulted in a clumsy device and still didn't solve the complexity of the interaction model. With poor experiences to control the TV so prevalent in the marketplace, more and more content is being consumed on small screens, such as phone, tablets, and laptops. At the same time, the mobile interaction model is proving to be great for navigation and control. And while the portability of the mobile devices and the user experience is very convenient, the actual consumption of the video on those small screens is subpar, particularly in shared screen scenarios like this, where you want to show your BFF your favorite summer vacation, or you want to share the latest biting movies. There is no doubt that users want to consume their content on the largest and most beautiful screen available to them. At the same time, rich and immersive experience is the best way to navigate the UI, and users are asking for such experiences. So why not give them the best of both worlds? The ubiquitous presence of the mobile devices in the homes mean that you, the developer, do not have to compromise on form or function. Users can get the same application that they already know and love on their phones, tablets, and laptops and cast to the best screen in the house, while still using their mobile device for email, web browsing, social activities, or the selection of the next video they want to watch, all without skipping a beat. <clears throat> Let's get to the ecosystem. Chromecast is a tremendous success, and it continues to exceed our expectations. Google Cast goes beyond Chromecast and extends our reach to more devices. We want consumers to have a choice of devices they use to consume their content in any room in the home. And we want developers to build their application using a consistent model for all devices. As you've seen from yesterday's keynote address, in addition to Chromecast, we've announced support for Google Cast <clears throat> on Android TVs, where all the Google Cast applications already developed for Chromecast will work seamlessly, still using the same simple Cast interaction model. Of course, 
This is being Google. We want it to go big on the ecosystem play for developers, making it as easy as possible to get your services and experiences onto all CAS devices and give you the opportunity to reach as many users as possible. We started out with five applications at launch, and today we have thousands more that integrate with CAST. These apps are available on Android and iOS, as well as web apps in Chrome, on Windows, Mac, and Chrome OS. The SDK is published and available for all developers to integrate with. You can CAST enable your app very easily. All you need to do is integrate discovery and control with the CAST SDK, and you're up and running. We wanted to make the cast button ubiquitous in all apps, obviously where it makes sense, and make that possible, we enable the cast SDK across the three most popular platforms, Android, iOS, and Chrome. We do believe it is critical to support the heterogeneous mobile device ecosystem you find in households today, and the usage data is proving that to be a necessity. Half of all Chromecast devices in the last months were used with mobile devices from multiple platforms. As you can see here, cross-platform support does matter, as my wife can attest to, where she uses her iPhone along with Chrome on Windows laptop and an Android tablet to watch her favorite content and play music throughout the house, all on Chromecast. Of course, one of our most important goals was to keep things consistent and simple. For users, we wanted to make sure that everything is simple and easy to use. And we did that by keeping the casting experience very close to your mobile experience. And rather than teaching users new ways to interface with your app, we keep them in the comfort of their familiar settings on their phones, tablets, or laptops. Whether they are playing back music on the phone or through the TV speakers using the Google Play Music service, they do so using the same Play Music app and the same interface to control that playback. For developers, we wanted to keep things simple and easy to integrate with. By using HTML5 for development on Google Cast devices, we harness the power of Chrome and the ease of JavaScript development and deployment. We've also invested in our media player library to make most, the most streaming formats supported seamlessly. And we continue to invest in this area adding more formats and more features that opens up the door for more content. On the sender side, our integration on the supported platforms is straightforward and integrates well with each platform development model. And we continue to invest in adding more features as we expand our application reach. Also, we've introduced strong UX guidelines <clears throat> to make sure that the user experience across application and devices when you are interacting with the TV is consistent familiar and easy to understand by the user. We never want to get the user lost or in a position where they don't know what to do next. Let's talk a bit about what trends we're seeing in the field. <clears throat> Media applications are obviously the lion's share of applications we're seeing, and they straddle three main uh, facets. Video is the first one. Whether it's big names, <clears throat> video streaming services like Netflix, Hulu Plus, or HBO, or smaller content aggregators, using the big screen for video has been the obvious choice for developers. Music is the other type of media that is proving to be a great match for the cast interaction model. It's so natural to control an extensive playlist using the phone. And beautiful images are a perfect candidate for the large screen. Showing and sharing photos, whether personal or just beautiful pictures that make the TV contributor to the home decor, Pictures, in general, make for a great living room experience. All of this content can be served either from the cloud, your mobile device, or a local cloud on other devices in the home. And with the ability to connect multiple mobile devices to a single session, these media apps can bring great use cases such as party mode, voting, and sharing content. And with the ease of use of mobile devices, these use cases would truly shine. We've talked a bit about media apps in the living room, which begs the question, what about games? Obviously, a big screen is better than a small one. It's more beautiful, more immersive, and more convenient to use. And for multiplayer games, having your mobile device being your controller allows for things that are just not possible using traditional controllers. 
For example, being able to hide a hand of card from the other players in the room or entering text in a high-paced trivia game, these are things that become trivially easy in the cast world. An example of such games is Big Web Quiz, where multiple players are competing with each other using their phones to make the selection presented by the game. We'll show you here a quick video just displaying how this thing works. Catchy too, huh? We can, <coughs> you can also go and play this game up on the third floor, and you might even request that tune for a ringtone. Uh, we are seeing a good number of games going live with this model, and there are a lot of great opportunity here for multiplayer space. One other great example of multi-sender is our very own home screen on Chromecast called Backdrop. Here, you see a stream of beautiful pictures show up on the TV screen, and everyone in the room who pulled their phone out to interact with, uh, with the screen would get a card describing the item on the screen. But each person would get a different set of actions associated with this card <clears throat> based on their behavior, permission, and interest. For example, in this particular uh, card, you see here a picture of Paris. John, who loves to cook, might just get actions related to French recipes. I, on the other hand, love art and Backdrop might just recommend a virtual tour of the Louvre or a new art exhibition related to Paris that is running nearby. This allows for a very personalized experience in the same app. And now, let me give the stage to John. Thanks, Maj. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm John Afaki, uh, and I manage the Google Cast SDK team. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the features we're currently working on. First, um, I'd like to talk about a feature we touched on in the keynote yesterday, which is the ability to cast from to nearby devices without being on the same Wi-Fi network. One of the key things we've been striving for while developing Google Cast is keeping things simple for users. While casting today is an easy task, low friction, once you're properly set up, uh, so the initial step of getting on the same Wi-Fi network can be really complicated. It doesn't matter if it's because you're worried about the privacy of your network, whether you have 14 random characters or characters that would be really hard to describe. Sometimes you just don't want to have your guests on your Wi-Fi network, and you want them to be able to just cast by simply being in the same room. So this new feature allows that. It allows uh, a Google Cast messages sent through the Google Cast SDK to be sent over the cloud between Google Cast devices and your phones, or tablets, or, or laptops, without the need to be on the same Wi-Fi network. To enable the feature, you'd first go to the Chromecast app and go to your device's settings and find the casting from nearby device feature. Enabling it allows your cast device to be discoverable from nearby devices. You only need to do this once, unless you want to turn it off, at which point you can go back there and turn it off. The other question everybody's asking, well, nearby devices, my neighbors, you know, could, weird things can start happening. Uh, but don't worry about that. Basically, there's, we have uh, extra things to protect you from that. Let's walk through an example to go into a little bit more detail. Let's say Majd, his phone in his pocket, walks into my living room, where I have a Chromecast set up uh, with the feature enabled. Now, when Maj launches a cast-enabled application, since a nearby Chromecast device is detected, and we use Android location services with this, the cast icon will appear. And when pressed, a new route's going to show up in, uh, on his device that says, uh, nearby devices, sorry. Uh, and uh, as you can see right there. When the route's selected, a pin code is ultrasonically played through the TV's speakers, and my Chromecast gets automatically connected. Now, the phone and Chromecast exchange a token via, uh, via the ultrasonic pairing, uh, and it temporarily pairs the two devices. At that point, they can talk to each other through our cloud over a TLS channel. If for some reason the ultrasonic token couldn't be exchanged, such as if the TV was off or muted, then the pin code could be manually entered in, the, in, the, in, the, in that dialog um, to get the same effect. Now, the pin code can be found on Backdrop. You can see it right there. 
Um, but if backdrop isn't visible, such as, again, if the TV's off or if you're in the middle of casting another application, I can get the pin for Maj by looking it up in my Chromecast app since I'm on the Wi-Fi network. Now, as a developer, this feature is enabled uh, for you without any changes needed in your app. Any data that you send through the Google Cast SDK will be transparently sent through this cloud channel. But if you send other kind of data, for example, you know, local media, um, then you'll be able to opt out of this feature because otherwise, uh, that, well, we can't send that data through our cloud for now. Um, so this feature really allows you to build great social experiences uh, in your apps without much worry about what it takes to hop onto the network and, and, and you know, get, get users started. Your users can just walk in, tap the task icon, and enjoy your app. Second, let's talk about some of the announcements we made on to, related to cast on Android TV. So Android TV devices have the exact same functionality that you've come to love with Chromecasts. Every Google Cast application written for Chromecast will work as is without any modifications to your, to, for Android TVs. Now, Android TVs typically also have a remote control along with uh, cast support. And so let's, get, let's walk through an example. Let's say my, uh, my daughter casts something from her tablet to my Android TV. And I wanted to talk to her. But I, did, I don't have my phone with me to pause uh, the media. Now, I could pick up the remote, the Android TV remote, and press a media command like pause or stop. And if the receiver application was coded using the Google Cast media namespace, then the application would seamlessly receive the message, the, the media messages, exactly as if it had been sent from a phone or tablet or laptop, without any, any changes made for, to your application. Now, the other thing is, with more and more Google Cast devices coming up on the market, one of the main things we wanted to do was avoid fragmentation. So in every Google Cast device, whether Chromecast or any Android TV, we're running the same cast receiver code, which will be kept up to date with background updates by Google, which means we are, your users will always be running the latest and greatest cast receivers. Third, we announced support for casting your Android screen to cast devices. Now, when we first launched Chromecast, we introduced one of the most popular features, which was the ability to cast a tab from Chrome. Now, this provided an easy way to get all of users' web content onto, the, onto Chromecast. Now, at the keynote yesterday, we announced that we'll be rolling out screencasting, which allows users to mirror their Android displays onto Google Cast devices. Now, this means, as a user, you can project your native Android apps, which may not yet be cast-enabled, to the big screen without the developer needing to do any work. However, with some changes, you, as the developer, can also extend your application to use multiple displays when, 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 when this is enabled, with the secondary display being mirrored onto your Google Cast device. You can do this by opening up a presentation display on the secondary screen when your app is being mirrored. Now, there's a lot of applications that benefit from split, uh, screen split experiences, and they can now take advantage of the big screen. So for example, here, you can see this is us earlier, um, uh, presentation apps with, uh, with speaker notes that could be on your phone while you're projecting the, the full-blown presentation on the TV. You can also build rich dual screen games that take full advantage of the processing power of your mobile device, but the beautiful display on your wall. Fourth, let's talk a little bit about enhancements to media applications. Now, one of the biggest items we launched with the release of the Google Cast SDK was the Media Player Library, bringing easy integration for Dash, HLS, and Smooth Stream to media applications. It really reduced the amount of time it takes to build media applications to a fraction of what it took before during the preview phase. Now, we're making constant improvements to, to this library, adding more formats and trying to make it even easier to integrate with your apps. Now, it's because of this library that the folks on the live stream right now are probably ignoring us and watching the live stream on Chromecast uh, for the US World Cup game. Now, accessibility is something that we take very seriously at Google, and we know you guys do too. So we're introducing full support for closed captioning in the Google Cast SDK, as well as in our default players. That means that you, the developer, don't need to build any custom UI to deal with users' caption settings, if you don't want to. You could, and, you, and we'll take those settings instead, but we'll have defaults in there. And you can use standardized messages to manage the on-off settings. No need to build a custom namespace to deal with, uh, with uh, closed captioning anymore. Now, your users will be able to set their caption settings on their mobile device settings page, and they'll be used on the Chromecast uh, or the Google Cast devices. And that means that each user can have personalized caption settings and manage their own preferences. They'll persist regardless of which Google Cast device you cast to. Now, this will be rolled out over the next few weeks as we roll out the, the update to, to the SDK. Now, there are, there are some mobile devices that don't support setting caption settings uh, for the mobile device. 
And so the users will be able to go to the Chromecast app to set defaults for the Google Cast devices. And those will be used if the, the, the settings aren't available on the phone. Now that'll come a little bit later this year. All right, let's talk about queuing. So for most music apps and many video apps, queuing is pretty much a re prerequisite, but there hasn't been a unified way of, of uh, building queues. Every single app that uses queuing today builds them in their own way. So we're working on adding a standardized queuing API to our SDK, which will handle the logistics of creating, modifying, and managing queues of media item. That means that you as an app developer can simply add items to your queue. Uh, and if you're using our default players, we'll automatically take care of playing them back in the right order and dealing with any kind of reorder. Now this will be a full-fledged API, which allows you to insert, remove, reorder items, and anything you'd expect from a queue. Um, yeah. So we're also building in full-featured media controls onto mobile devices, allowing users to interact with whatever's currently playing with regards to media uh, from any device. Now, I'll go through an example. If I'm playing back media from an application on my laptop, and my wife were to pick up her tablet, which wouldn't have the corresponding uh, Android or iOS app uh, associated with, uh, with that app, um, and I would, she would still be able to pause, resume, seek, and any common media uh, um, action that you'd take simply because her application was built using the, the standard media namespace. Now, authentication and credential exchange is another challenge that the majority of developers have to deal with. We're also working on a providing a simple, secure way to deal with the transfer of, of credentials from senders to receivers so that your services can seamlessly authenticate on Google Cast. Now, this will be integrated with queuing so that if different items in your queue require different credentials, you could pass the token at insert time and you won't have to deal with it at playback time. For example, in an app where, say, Maj and I wanted to add music to a queue and the, the service required authentication for each item, Maj could add the item and his token would be passed along with the item in the queue. I would add something to the queue uh, and uh, my credentials would be passed. We could toss our phones out the window, drive over the phone or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And the items would be, uh, uh, the playback would be able to go back smoothly because, uh, because the credentials were already there. So we're adding more features to the SDK, but another key area that we're investing in is to make sure that your users can find your apps. New APIs are key, but an app is only great if it can reach its users. And we're, so we're making it easier for them to find your applications. At the keynote yesterday, we talked about the redesigned Chromecast.com slash apps website which allowed users to browse and find apps for all of our platforms. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, we released an updated developer console which allowed us to gather information to use for that and assets to use to feature your apps. Now, and as more and more developers enter their data in the console, you'll see their apps show up on the site. But that's just the beginning and more, more discovery features are coming to the, to the website. We're also making improvements to the Play Store to make it even easier to search for cast-enabled apps. This will bring relevant, recommended applications to cast users to the forefront. We're also going to build in Chromecast, a support in the Chromecast app to surface apps that our users already have installed but actually don't know are cast-enabled. So, the, so they'll be able to discover them from the Chromecast app. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about some use cases beyond media. As Mars said earlier, the majority of the apps that we're seeing are media applications. Uh, and much of that is because we're heavily focused on making that happen. Now, there are, however, many areas we're seeing uh, quite a few apps show up. And over the next year, we'll be making enhancements to the Google Cast SDK across the board to make it even easier to, uh, for you guys to enable those scenarios. Now, the living room TV is mainly used for two reasons. The first one's obvious, and it's media, and we've talked about that. Now, the second one is gaming. Now, with the number of daily active users of mobile devices absolutely dwarfing the overall number of active console users, the audience for multi-screen games is huge. Now, the interaction model enabled by the devices that users already have today uh, allow you to create games that simply aren't practical to build on your platform. With the phone, for example, users have a controller that have a great touch screen, a beautiful display, a camera, a microphone, a gyroscope, and an accelerometer, and you can create multiplayer games that anyone can join without the need to purchase any additional custom hardware and use all these features. Now, as a sometime lazy parent, I'm, guilty as, I'm as guilty as anyone of using the TV as a babysitter, which gives it a really bad rep. With Google Cast, you can, create, you can build creative educational software that can now make me look like a smart babysitter for using the TV. 
Now with the big screen being used to watch, say, video clips or images, for example, the entire surface of my child's touch screen could be used for interaction, either via drawing or keyboards or whatever interaction model you choose to have. Those hands may be little, but they really need a lot more surfaces than, uh, surface than ours do. Now another great use case would be adding in multi-center capabilities into those educational games. For example, you could give the ability to, uh, for a parent to provide help or assistance to a child from a second device while they're playing their game on the first one so that it doesn't interfere with your child's touchscreen experience and builds their confidence. Now going beyond the living room, the usage of cast devices in classrooms can make for a really immersive experience. In more and more cases, students are, are encouraged to use tablets or laptops for their classes. Now whether it's, class, it's for classroom presentations, real-time quizzes, or just to drill deeper into whatever the teacher is currently presenting, being able to interact with the classroom just keeps students engaged. Now enterprise, now enterprise is also a space where using a cast remote is pretty much a daily occurrence. So for example, being able to cast a presentation, like we're doing today, drive a video conference, we do that all the time, or even simple obvious use cases like digit, manage digital signage. There are thousands of use cases that can be enabled by Google Cast in the enterprise. Like for example, this guy probably would have something up on a screen if he used Google Cast. Now as you can see, there's a lot of room for innovative, fresh, impactful apps, and we're here to help. The, the main thing we want you folks to get out of this presentation is that we're evolving the, the Google Cast ecosystem based off of what you guys are telling us. We're constantly listening to the feedback, trolling the forums, li looking at the developer community on, on G+, and we're, we're looking to see what you guys want us to improve on. And so we want you to keep that feedback coming because we're really only just beginning. So if you want to learn more about Google Cast, while well, you're here, you probably know much about it, but if you want to learn more about it, uh, you can see it, you can find it at, uh, you can find more information at google.com slash cast and developer.google.com slash cast. So we're going to take the rest of the time for questions. Thanks. Hello, uh, Sasha Goldman from the Slink Media. I have two questions. First one, you described the new great features that you uh, <clears throat> will have in media player extension like closed captions. Uh, does it apply to the uh, custom receivers as well? Yeah, so with the custom receivers, you'll be able to access, let's take queuing for example. You'll have a queue object uh, and you will get events when an item finishes playing and there'll be hooks for you to do whatever it is that you're doing. So for example, if you were to not use a, a, a standard video tag to play back, you'll get an event which will tell you, hey, you should be playing back this item. So there'll be hooks in order for you to do that. We just can't do full playback because we don't know exactly what your custom application will be, uh, how your uh, custom application interacts. But yeah, all of these features will be usable by, by that. They just need a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. And thank you. And second question, uh, I asked that before, and I'm wondering if anything changed in opening your open platform to other platforms like Microsoft uh, on uh, uh, Google Cast SDK site. Um, <clears throat> so we evaluate the addition of a, a new platform based on uh, popularity and user uh, and usage. Uh, as other platform become more popular, we'll, we'll investigate that. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously have support for Windows on Chrome, uh, and we see a lot of applications being developed there, so. Yeah, Chrome is great, and I remember answering, uh, uh, take the Chromios and embed it in your application, which is impractical. Uh, question is, actually have the .NET based, C Sharp based SDK that we can integrate in our existing line of, of the products. Right now, we, we can support Roku, we can support Xbox One, we cannot support Chromecast. And we support Chromecast on any other platforms except Windows. And basically, as uh, uh, a product, from our product perspective, we're abandoning our uh, customers on Windows side, which is actually quite large uh, by popularity uh, from our point of view. That's uh, the practicality of that uh, uh, question. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, have you guys worked at all with the Chrome remote desktop team, essentially turning Chromecast into anywhere VPNs to turn any screen into the, whatever computer you're connecting to? Uh, we constantly are talking to the Chrome team. One of the challenges there is how you actually deal with the uh, extension. Do you mean like the ability to promote into your desktop from, from say, your mobile device 
and uh, yeah. So if I was just to take the, my Chromecast, plug it into this projector, remote it into my computer at home, and have a keyboard connected to the Chromecast, to essentially turn the screen into my computer from home streaming. Uh, um, it's an interesting use case. Uh, we'll, we'll, we need to discuss it with the remote desktop team. Yeah, so I was going to say, Dell came out with a USB HDMI stick similar to you guys mm -hmm. that essentially runs an entire computer on there, so you can turn any screen into a computer, but with Chromecast being so light and the Chrome remote desktop team making such amazing advances, advances on that side, mending the two together could almost turn that into an anywhere platform. Yep. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the devices which are not on Wi-Fi. Um, there will not be a discovery option if the uh, content to be streamed is local. Yes. So how do an application, uh, I'm building an application which is streaming local content. Now, do I need to make any changes to tell the caustic service that my content is local and not coming from a foreign location? So uh, when you talk about local content, you mean content, say, on your phone or on your, on yes. your uh, tablet, right? Yeah. Uh, well, so one of the main challenges is, you know, the, 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 the the, the, our, our messaging system is optimized for the cloud messaging system is optimized for the Google Cast SDK, which usually is somewhat short burst messages, um, which, which is mostly about notifying your application. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we're not right now ready to deal with, say, a five gigabyte file that you'll be streaming uh, through there. Now, if you were dealing with local content, say, with the ability to, you could probably pass a URL that may be accessible from the cloud and that you would, you'd be able to stream it. But your URL, say, you know, in, in typical cases, you'd be opening up a, port, a local port, say, you know, 192 uh, address space, right? You wouldn't be able to stream your media that way. But if you were to open up something that could go through the NAT and through the, the open internet, then you'd be able to stream it. We just can't send large media file. Essentially, the Google Cast SDK uh, channels are really meant for notifications and, and, uh, and messages. True, but so in that case, how do I make sure my so, application do oh, not give option I to see. the user? Well, we, we won't be able to have the option. Essentially, when we talk about opt out of this feature, because essentially you, you might end up with a somewhat broken experience where you think your address is 192, blah, 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 and the, the cast device on the other side is going to go, yeah, it's not. You can find that deal. Right. Yeah. And so um, in the developer portal, uh, in the developer console, you'll be able to basically opt out of local discovery, which means that in your application, uh, the user will not see the nearby devices okay, uh, feature. Okay, that, That's what I was looking for. Yeah, we just want to make sure that, you know, as much as we want to make sure that all your use cases are there, we really want to make sure we protect the, uh, the, the end user also. Right. So. Thank you. Um, any new word on, like, um, Can you come closer? Sorry. sorry. Any new word on casting from your desktop and not using Chrome? Um, so if you're, do you have a DVD uh, or a Blu-ray disc <coughs> and you put it in your laptop and you want to stream it? From that way, like, is there any way you could? Because I know you guys are working on that, and be having uh, audio problems. From what I've lo looked up, and do you mean the uh, the desktop? Uh, yeah, desktop. Desktop mirroring feature. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about mirroring or uh, yeah, casting? Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, uh, command and control. Yeah, like casting your desktop on the screen. Uh, so we, we continue to investigate in, uh, this is currently, it's, a, uh, in, uh, it's an experimental feature. Yeah. We're experimenting with that. There are challenges into casting the full, uh, into mirroring the full desktop. And oh. we're, we're still working on that. Oh, okay, cool, thanks. Uh, are you guys looking into doing primitives for images or slideshows? Um, you, do you mean like, for example, a default, the equivalent of a default player for that? Yeah, exactly. Like you have a media player for video. Uh, would you have like, say, a slideshow player for uh, images? Uh, I believe our default players actually allow you to at least cast one uh, image right now. And as we'll add queuing, we'll have support for, for images also as part of those. Okay. So you'll be able to essentially add yeah. item, uh, images, yeah, images to a without, queue. Yeah, without any other media, and it'll cycle through them. Yeah. Okay. Cool, thank you. No problem. Along those lines, um, we've noticed a lot of apps with, uh, you know, that you can cast photos and slideshows. But one thing about those, to me at least, they're boring without music. So is there, I mean, it would require, I guess, two streams, but mm -hmm. is there any opportunity there to be able to cast, like, photos from a source and music as well? Uh, you mean from different sources? There's nothing well, today preventing any application from playing back audio and, sh and showing photos at the same time. Essentially, if you, if you think about what Chromecast is, you've got the full power of HTML. And I got, as, far as, I'm, I, as far as I know, you could actually play back audio and video or audio and images on the web, right? I mean, obviously, sorry. Uh, and so in this particular case, if you're talking about, say, being able to cast a Google Play Music 
while doing your photos. We have no plans of allowing uh, two applications to run in parallel on that. Mostly because the interaction model is for users might get very complicated. That's true. That's, yeah. And but but there's nothing preventing an application, for example, from deciding to be able to play background music or you know allow you to cast from uh, uh, you know, audio and photos at the same time. Is that something the Android TV would be able to solve if somebody wanted to say cast play music and then have their photos streaming at the same time? Still, you, you still have the same problem with the user. If the user is using their phone, if, yeah. if they want to pause, which one do they want to pause? So until we figure out how to do that on the sender side, it's, it's uh, irrelevant of what, what the receiver it, is. It, it, it's not really a platform limitation. It really, we're trying to make sure that the interaction model is great. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, what's going to be the audio and video latency for the new mirroring feature from Android to Chromecast? Uh, we're, we're trying to make it as, uh, as Low latency as possible. We, we're not going to we're not going to publish any number at this, at this time. Okay. It's still as as was announced yesterday. It's still a beta feature. So yeah. is it going to be faster or slower than from the um, browser? It, it should be faster. Should be I mean, lo lower latency. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I mean, you saw the demo yesterday, and you'll be seeing it very shortly. Um, I mean, we've been playtesting it with games and and all sorts of things. So it's it's very Low. responsive. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Same question. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, two for one. Um, I haven't played this with this in a little bit, so it might have gotten better. But I remember we were working on in like our office having like a bunch of default applications running on these Chromecasts, and then we want people to be able to put something up and then have that application like seamlessly come back when they're done. And I remember we were having some difficulties, kind of like writing our own screensaver sort of thing. Um, is there any plan to put in like APIs to easily easily support having your own version of like a screensaver for the Chromecast? Um, yes and no. Um, n not as a complete uh, replacement for Backdrop, but as, as Rishi announced yesterday, we're going to be talking to third-party developers to have the ability to add, for them to add their own uh, feeds into, into Backdrop. So, but. Hi. So with the screen mirroring, is there going to be an option for individual applications to turn that off, say, for example, for apps that may have the rights to display video on the small screen but not on the big screen? Uh, so this is a, on Android, it's a system API, uh, not system API, it's a system uh, function, and uh, depending on the level of security that you have uh, in terms of uh, content protection, you'll be able to control that. It's a, this is all part of the presentation API in Android. Thank you. Since you're adding uh, media control from the Android uh, TV remotes to the Chromecast, would it be possible to do the same with a GMI CEC uh, on the old Chromecast? It's a great feature. <laughs> We're looking into that. Um, do you have any timeline as far as when the Q API and some of the other um, things that you talked about are going to be actually live on Chromecast? So uh, the closed captioning APIs are essentially rolled out. We're, I mean, we talked about rolling out the, the new Google Play services uh, with, with uh, screencasting and, and, ca and um, Closed captioning is part of that, so it'll be over the next few weeks. When we're talking about queuing and ID delegation, we're currently working on that, and it's soon. Um, it's okay. it's going to be in an upcoming release. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just had a question about the uh, certain, you know, the video file types that uh, Chromecast supports. Uh, will there be an update to that, or is it a limitation to the hardware? I know currently you can use something like Plex or something, but you have to run a server, you know, on a computer. Is there? going to be an update to maybe these so codecs? On the, on the codec itself, uh, uh, unfortunately, this is a hardware limitation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but on, on the uh, container and transport stream, that we are adding as we go. So okay. uh, codec, it's H.264 up to high profile, as well as uh, VP8 uh, on video. On, on audio, we have a, a much larger list. Uh, in terms of uh, streaming format, uh, we support the uh, MP4 based and MPEG2 TS based, but we are adding as, uh, as we go. Okay, thank you. Um, when casting, I'd love to be able to put my headphones in my phone and then get the music from the TV. So are you taking that into consideration and do you have a best practice or a best approach for that? The, the, the trick there is making sure you have the synchronization right. Mm -hmm. um, it, over Wi-Fi, things become challenging, but it is definitely an area of investment for us. We are looking, we, we still don't have an answer. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a silver bullet here. But uh, we're, we're looking into ways to, to make it easier. So we'll provide you with some synchronization, so you can, uh, uh, some timing information, sorry, so you can synch synchronize audio and video. 
Um, I'm Romain from France, uh, France Media Monde, uh, and uh, we recently released uh, a Chromecast-enabled uh, application uh, on Android, uh, which is France 24, and we had uh, problems integrating uh, the um, live streaming of our uh, channel uh, because of cross-domain uh, policies. Do you plan on lower, lowering restrictions or giving guidelines for uh, standard uh, uh, streaming solutions like was a media server? Go ahead. Uh, so cross-domain auth is something that the web is, is dealing with, right? And the reason the majority of apps don't run into this on normal web is because most use Flash or, or well, less and less, but many are using Flash. So we're actually, we want to keep the development process as close as possible to the web development process, which means that at least for now, cross-domain uh, cross auth is, is staying. We are, we, I think Leon Nichols posted some, uh, something on the developer guidelines. forum. Sorry? Guidelines. Yeah, yeah some guidelines on, on how to deal with it. Uh, we are going to look, we, we know this is a challenge for many people, particularly during development. Because once you go to production, you're a little bit more set up. But you know, developing from your, your, your dev machine, it's always harder to get a live stream. So we're looking into ways of making it easier, but cross-domain auth is, is, uh, is, is here to stay. And also, we're working with a uh, main player in the industry, uh, particular CDN providers, to find uh, alternatives as well. Uh, make it easier for development. Thank you. Um, are you looking at uh, getting 5 gigahertz or other Wi-Fi protocols like enterprise security supported on the hardware? Um, either through a Gen 2 or Android TVs? Um, so we, 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 we can't talk about future hardware, um, but these are stuff that uh, are interesting for us. Since the hardware uh, capabilities of uh, Android TV and the old Chromecast is different, especially regarding codecs supported and encryption and so on, uh, is there going to be any difference in supported uh, video files on the Chromecast and Android TV? Uh, so actually, it will be identical. Uh, Android, we, we are putting all the, uh, the uh, hardware requirements in terms of uh, codec, DRM, and uh, streaming it, as part of the Android TV uh, requirement. And whatever runs on Chromecast would run on, on uh, Android TV. So for example, if I had a 4K source, I wouldn't be able to play through Chromecast on Android TV. Mm -hmm. Through casting. Hi. So this is last question because we're running out of time. Okay, um, we are developing an app for uh, the Kindle Fire, and uh, uh, when we are using the uh, Chromecast SDK, uh, it uses the uh, Google Play uh, framework. So, uh, is there a way to using other uh, non Google Google Play? Unfortunately, at this moment, that's not possible. Uh, the SDK is part of the Google Play services, and it's not available on Kindle. Oh, OK. OK, okay uh, so I want to make a, one last announcement. Uh, before you leave, if you go at the uh, corner there, uh, we're giving away uh, free Chromecasts. Thank you for attending. Thank you.